All right, Acts chapter 3, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. says, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his, his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us, as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob... The God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Turn over with me for just uh, several verses to Acts 4. And in verse 7, the apostles are being interrogated by the council. It says, when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power... Or by what name have you done this? Now, this doesn't mean which name. In the Greek, it really means what kind of power or what kind of name. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are being judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he's been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. Today we want to build your faith for healing in the name of Jesus. Wherever we look in the New Testament, we can see God's healing power at work. Jesus taught his disciples that healing is one of the signs that tells us that the kingdom of God has come near to us. When there are healings in our midst, it tells us that God is graciously reaching out to people with the love of Jesus. Healing is an invitation from heaven to taste and see that the Lord is good, that he's a good God who cares about people and their needs. He not only cares about our spiritual welfare, but he also cares about our physical suffering. When we see people being healed in the name of Jesus, it tells us that God wants to magnify that name. He wants the name of Jesus to receive honor and praise from men. So let's look at healing in the name of Jesus and then At the conclusion of our service today, we're going to worship at the Lord's table, and then we're going to pray for people in Jesus' name. And I believe that we're going to see God at work in our midst today, praying for the sick. The title of my message today is, Have Faith in Jesus' Name. Have Faith in Jesus' Name. Let's pray. Will you pray with me, and let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and minister out of the Word this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus, Lord, and we thank you for your word, the gift of the word that you've given to us. It's a lamp for our feet, and it's the light for our pathway. Jesus said that the word of God is like seed. So, Father, we pray that our hearts now would be good soil in these next few moments, soil that can receive 
and hold on to and bear fruit from the seed of the word of God. Jesus, you said, the words you speak to us, they are spirit and they are life. So, Holy Spirit, please come now and minister life to us from the scriptures. If you agree with that prayer, please say amen. 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 When was the last time that you thought about the meaning of your name? You know, some people never give their names a second thought. Some do a lot of digging into the meaning of their names. I want to ask by a show of hands, how many of you know the meaning of your first name? You know what your first name means. Wow, most of you do. How many of you know the meaning of your last name? Not so many, but still a pretty good number. Some of us have common names. Some of us have names that used to be common, but aren't so common anymore. I was interested to find that according to the Social Security Administration, these are now the most common names for boys. Noah. Liam, Mason, Jacob, and William. And for little girls, the most common names are Emma, Olivia, Sophia, Isabella, and Ava. Now, if we turn the, yeah, if we turn the clock back 100 years to 1916, we see it was a little different. The most popular names for boys were John, William, James, Robert, and Joseph. And for the girls, it was Mary, Helen, Dorothy, Margaret, and Ruth. So times have changed. But some of us have names that are a little more unusual. If you're like me, you get asked questions like, how do you spell that again? (laughs) Or my favorite, right? Maybe some of you get this. Okay, so what nationality are you? (laughs) Some of our... Some of us have spent a whole lifetime getting our names mispronounced and mangled. Shakespeare famously asked, what's in a name? And the answer is actually quite a bit. When we hear certain names, our minds experience a flash of recognition. And maybe we experience some feelings too. We react when we hear names like Elvis or Madonna or Adolf or Judas In the ancient world, names were important, probably more so than today. People thought that your name revealed your nature or your character and could give insight into your destiny. You know, in our culture, people many times choose their children's names just based on how they like the sound of the name. But in the Bible, this was not the case. A name stood for the person who carried it. It represented them. A person's name was a prophetic marker. It was meant to encourage somebody and point them to a good future in God's plan. You may not know the meaning of your name, but in Israel, names were considered a blessing or a curse depending on their meaning. David's name meant beloved. And I have to imagine that that was probably an encouragement to him down throughout his entire life. On the other hand, maybe you've heard of a man named Jabez. His name meant pain. How would you like to have to explain that every single day of your life? You know, Jabez's mother had a tough time in labor, and I guess she wanted to make sure everybody in Israel knew about it. It's true. But Jabez's name was a spur that God used in his life to drive him closer to God, and ultimately he was blessed. Sometimes people decide that they've got no choice but to change their name if they want to change their destinies. And maybe you've even changed your name to get a fresh start. Some people change their name even in our day when they come to faith in Christ because their birth names are connected to other gods. They want to sever that connection. You know, many people who come out of Islam or Hinduism want their names to be changed so that they no longer refer to the gods of those religions. Many Christian people in Asia use the name Masi, which means Messiah. It's a way of saying to the world, now I belong to Jesus. In your name, And the reputation that goes along with it is one of the most important things that you own. The Bible says a good name is better than ointment. And in the Bible, as in our society, though, you could also use another person's name. And that's what we're talking about this morning. To use another person's name is to stand in the shoes of that other person. It means that you get to use the good name of another person whose name perhaps carries a little more weight than your own name does. 
in ancient times, you could appoint somebody else to use your name and to act on your behalf. You may remember that Father Abraham sent out his servant, Eleazar, with a lot of authority to act in his name. Abraham sent Eleazar to find a wife for his son, Isaac. How many of you know you really have to trust somebody to let them pick out a spouse for your kid? Young people, be glad that you live today. Can you imagine? I've had it with you, Junior. I'm going to find you a wife. You'll figure that out about 2 o'clock. But... Now, that would be quite a stretch in our culture, but in that culture, dealing with a messenger was considered to be the same thing as dealing with the man who sent the messenger. In the ancient world, you could make somebody your personal representative by giving him letters of authorization, or you could give him your ring to wear. You know, the Romans had rings that they used with a seal to stamp documents in wax. And so if you wore somebody's ring, it didn't necessarily mean you were married to them. It could have meant that you had authority to do business on their behalf. The closest thing that we probably have to this would be a power of attorney, right? When you give somebody a power of attorney, what are you doing? You are appointing them to manage some of your affairs. You're giving them authority to handle certain things for you. Now, the powers of attorney that many of us are familiar with give somebody else perhaps the right to do my banking or maybe to make medical decisions for me. Now, this is very important for our discussion concerning the name of Jesus today. If I give you a power of attorney, then the bank or the hospital has to treat you as if you were actually me. Your signature will be considered to be my signature. And so the right to use another person's name can be significant. It all depends on who that man is and how much authority his name holds. Now, I'm sorry to tell you, if you have the right to use my name this afternoon, I'm not sure that will do you a tremendous amount of good in things of this world. But what if you had the right to make investments for Bill Gates? I read last night that Bill Gates is once again considered to be the richest man in the world, and he has a net worth of $87 billion. That's a lot of money. Turn to your neighbor and say, I think that would cover phase two. <laughs> no, don't do that. But listen, church, if you had a power of attorney from Bill Gates, the bank would treat you with a little more respect than they usually do. Now, I've been taking time to dig into the idea of names and, and their power because in our culture, we don't often understand the power of names or using another man's name. But in the scripture passages we read today, we can see that people in the time of Jesus were very aware that names could carry spiritual power. That's why the council members asked Peter and John that strange question in Acts chapter 4. By what power or by what name have you done this? As we mentioned, they were really asking, by what kind of power or what kind of name have you healed this man? In other words, you are using a kind of power that we don't know about. You are using some kind of a name that we are unfamiliar with. Now notice this, that the leaders knew that there were two ways the healing could have happened. Healing required some power, and so they knew that one way healing could come was by the exercise of power. The other way was by the use of a name that could carry someone else's power. They believed that some names had power. Obviously, they believed that you could be healed by the authority that was contained in somebody else's name. Now, that may be a very strange and new concept to you, but to them, it was normal and also biblically accurate. So this is the question that we need to explore today. If being able to use the name of the richest man in the world, or maybe to use the name of the President of the United States, if that's a powerful thing, what would happen if you had, to, if you had the right to use the name of the man in charge of running the universe? 
What if you had the right to use the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? We need to explore that together. And I want to give you a simple way to, to begin to think about this in your own mind and understand how authority and names work. Two questions we need to ask ourselves. Put on your thinking cap with me. Question number one is this. Spiritually speaking, how much power does a man's name have? And the answer is as much power as that man himself possesses. Question number two brings it down home and makes it more personal to us. How much power do I have when I'm using somebody else's name then? And the answer is, as much power as he himself has given to me. So how do we operate in somebody else's authority? This is, this is going to be good here. Let's think about how a chain of command works. If you think through this with me, it's going to help us understand the authority that belongs to us through the name of Jesus. First, let's assume that somebody in power, someone in authority, wants to accomplish something. Authority begins to flow down from them to you when that person authorizes you to act for them, when that person makes you their agent. What has happened then? They have granted you authority. Then the person in authority will spell out what it is exactly that you are authorized to do on their behalf. In other words, we would say they have defined your authority. So now you've been granted authority and your authority has been defined. And so now that you know that you are authorized to act, you can begin to act on that person's behalf. People will have to recognize that you have authority for the person in power. They will understand that you have authority to act not in your own name, but you have authority to act in the other person's name. Are you tracking with me? You didn't know you were going to school today. You thought you were going to church, but it's all right. Let me give you an example from the real world that we can all connect to. Let's think about what happens when the government creates a police force. How many of you are thankful for the police officers who are with us here today? We appreciate them very much. All right, let's pretend that you live in a place, for whatever reason, where there's no police force. So step number one then your city has to pass a law creating a police department. That tells you what the goal is. The city wants to maintain law and order, right? The next thing they need to do is they need to authorize someone to act for them. And so what do they do? They commission some people to be police officers. And once they are sworn in, they become the representatives of the city. And then the city will spell out the authority of their police officers by describing their powers. Once they do that, the police officers will know how, when, where they can use their authority. Once all that happens, now the police can function in that authority. They can function as police according to the guidelines they've received. They are now fully authorized agents with an understanding of what they can do. Now, I hope you can see where I'm going with all this. Let's look at the case now of believers in Christ. The Father, the Bible tells us, is the source of all authority. And he gave his authority to Jesus. More about that in a minute. Jesus, in turn, gave us his authority by giving us his name to use. Are you with me? And then Jesus explains that authority to us, what that looks like, how we use it in the Bible. And we then, as believers, can begin to exercise the authority that Jesus gave to us. That's why Jesus was impressed with the faith of the Roman centurion. The centurion was a military man. He understood a chain of command. He understood uh, how authority works. He said, Jesus, I don't need you to come over my house. You just say the word right from here and my servant will be healed. Why? Because he understood that Jesus had received authority from God. And because of that, sickness was obligated to obey Jesus even at a distance because he had authority. 
And you and I can develop a strong faith in Jesus' name, just like that centurion. How many of you would like to be used by the Lord to heal some people? Amen. Okay, half of you want to heal people. I guess the rest of you want to prophesy. It's okay. (laughs) The Bible says faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. And if we want to grow in our faith, not only to receive healing for ourselves, but to pray for others, then we need to read and hear and meditate on what the Bible says about the name of Jesus. We need to get these truths into our spirits so that we can see our faith increase. Faith for healing in Jesus' name. And before we share in communion this morning and pray for healing, we're going to quickly look at three important truths concerning the name of Jesus. And I want to recommend to you that you study these things more on your own. Obviously, we can't go into so much depth in a weekend sermon on these matters. But I want to encourage you to dig into them on your own to build your faith. But even as we look into these things briefly this morning, I believe the Holy Spirit will give us help, and some of you will be able to pray with greater faith to heal the sick right away. Three important truths about the name of Jesus, and the first one is this, the power of the name of Jesus. Everybody say that, the power of of the name of Jesus. As we said, if I can use your name, then I have the legal right to do what you can do. And if we're called to use the name of Jesus, then we need to understand how much authority the name of Jesus contains. Remember, we said that Jesus was given his authority from God, who is the source or the fountain of all authority. And when we study the scriptures, we discover what kind of authority that was, and therefore, we discover what authority is contained in his name. First, the Bible says that God has made Jesus to be Lord. I want you to say, Jesus is Lord. Lord. Come on, make a declaration of that. Jesus is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord of men and angels and fallen angels and demons. Church, if the God of Israel is called the Lord in the Old Testament, then we cannot help noticing that Jesus is called Lord all throughout the New Testament. In Acts chapter 2, Peter told the crowd, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this same Jesus whom you crucified to be Lord and Christ. Second, Jesus' name has been exalted by God. The name of Jesus has been placed above every name that exists. In Philippians 2, the Apostle Paul says, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, and those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come on, give him a praise for that. Third, Jesus has been seated at the right hand of God. And we need to look at this for a minute because this is a phrase that we use very casually quite often, but we don't spend a lot of time necessarily thinking about what it means to say that Jesus has been seated at the right hand of God. The right hand of God is the highest place of authority anywhere. We know that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all equally God from all eternity. However, the scriptures consistently teach us that the Father is the person of the Godhead, the person of the Trinity, from whom authority flows. And that's why Jesus said, my Father is greater than I. He didn't say, my Father is God and I am something less than him in that respect. Jesus said, my Father is greater than I, greater in authority. But now, since Jesus rose from the dead and returned to the Father, the Bible also says that Jesus has been elevated to the Father's level to sit at the right hand of the Father. 
That's what it means when the Bible tells us that Jesus has been seated at the right hand of power or the right hand of the Father. Jesus said, take hold of this promise. Let it blow your mind. Jesus said, the one who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me in my throne, just as I also overcame and have sat down with my Father in his throne. That is the highest seat of power. And it means that everything has been placed under Jesus' feet. If Jesus were any higher than where he's sitting right now today, he would have to be promoted to a rank higher than God. In Ephesians 1, we read, God seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above, not a little bit above, but far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and, listen, gave him to be the head over all things to the church. What does that mean? To be given the right to use the name of Jesus means that you are receiving the right to use the name of the person who holds the most authority in all of creation and heaven. The right to use the name that is above every name. So the first important truth we need to get into our spirits is the reality of the power of the name of Jesus. The second truth we need to grasp is this. You and I have been given the privilege to use the name of Jesus. We have the privilege to use Jesus' name. You know, Peter and John weren't carrying any cash that day, but the riches they did have were more beneficial for the lame man. They had the right to use the name of Jesus. Church, please notice that when Jesus received authority from his father, he did not turn around and simply give that authority to the entire human race. Remember how authority works. The right to use another man's name requires first that he specifically gives you his name to use. A power of attorney only authorizes you if I put your name in it. Otherwise, you cannot do anything on my behalf. Think about our little police department example from a minute ago. You can't just wake up in the morning and make yourself a police officer. Somebody has to commission you to become a police officer. And in just the same way, the privilege to use the name of Jesus is something that only belongs to those who are in a covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus belongs to those who are in Christ. The authority of Jesus' name belongs to those who believe in him. Jesus said, these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. In my name, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. At the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus said an amazing thing. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore. Now, that makes no sense whatsoever, unless by saying that, he was also at the same time giving you and me the right to use his name. In other words, let me say it like this. Jesus did not say, I have all authority, and so I am going. No, he said, I have all authority, so I am sending you. Do you get it? He wanted his disciples to keep doing in his name what they already were doing because they had already, even before Jesus ascended, those people had already been using his name to do works of power. Do you remember even when Jesus was still walking the earth, they told Jesus, they said, Lord, even the demons are subject to us through your name. And he wants you and me to do the same things today through his name. 
All across the New Testament, people who were led by the Holy Spirit used the name of Jesus to release the power of God. It was more than just the 12. It was more than just the 120 or the 500 that Jesus was referring to because Jesus didn't qualify it that way. He said, the one who believes in me will do the works that I have been doing and even greater works than those. Now, church, people who are not in relationship with God through Jesus Christ cannot exercise his authority. They don't have a share. They don't have a portion in that name. They don't have a part in that inheritance. And we saw this in the case of some traveling exorcists back in Acts chapter 19 who tried to use the name of Jesus like a magical charm to cast out some demons. Luke tells us, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man, the men said, "Uh uh-oh, right, at that point. (laughs) Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. How many of you know that's a bad day at work? (laughs) Right? Come home at 5 o'clock. How was exorcism today, honey? Right? But what was the result? Luke says, this became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Now we read before how God gave Jesus to be the head over all things to the church. So the name of Jesus only belongs to the church, to those who trust in him. And that means that this name belongs to you today and you and you if you're a believer in Jesus. You've been given that high privilege of heaven to speak to sickness and demons in the name of Jesus and set people free. Praise God. One more thing we need to understand today, and it's this. We need to grasp the purpose of of using the name of Jesus. What is the purpose of using the name of Jesus? Worship team, you can come back, please, and help us if you would. What is God's purpose in giving us the name of Jesus? What is God trying to accomplish besides the obvious work of setting people free? Why do we use his name in healing and in deliverance? Well, I believe God has a number of purposes for giving us that name. First, God wants to magnify the name of Jesus, meaning he wants to make it great. He wants to make it famous. And you see, when those exorcists were defeated by those demons, the name of Jesus got honor. Unbelievers could see that the name of Jesus was a name like no other name. And whenever something wonderful happens in the name of Jesus, his name is magnified. Church, God's intention is that everyone would honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Did you know that Jesus said that? You know, a lot of people nowadays are very content just to worship God or to honor God perhaps as the creator, as someone who's watching out over mankind in general. But things get a little squirrely, don't they, when you bring the J word into it? When you introduce Jesus into the situation of somebody who just wants to talk about God, things change. But see, Jesus said in John chapter 5, we could look it up. Jesus said, the Father judges no one, but the Father has committed all judgment to the Son so that everyone should honor the Son as they honor the Father. Could you imagine that? And then Jesus said, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. This tells us that God is no longer content just to let people honor him in general as creator. We must, God says, give him honor through the Son. 
When we demonstrate the power of the name of his son, Jesus, this causes glory to come to the name of the son. It causes people to honor the son the way that they honor the father. Second, God wants to demonstrate Jesus' true identity. Using the name of Jesus enables you to demonstrate Jesus' true identity. We can't discuss this in depth, but do a little Bible study. If you read the book of Acts, you can see that the power that is in Jesus' name proves that Jesus is exactly who he said he was. And it proves that he is exactly who the apostles said he was. They called Jesus by a variety of titles, all of which were proven to be true by virtue of the power that was released through his name. The apostles called him Lord. They called him Messiah. They called him the cornerstone. They called him the Holy One. They called him the Prince of Life. They called him the Son of God. And all of those titles show who Jesus really is. He's more than just a philosopher or a prophet. And the power that's contained within his name proves that he is what they said he was. And as somebody once said, that's good preaching right there. And finally, God wants us to continue Jesus' mission by using his name. Luke tells us that the Gospels are all about everything that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up. And everything that the church has done since Jesus was taken up is simply a record of what Jesus has done through you and through me. Through the name of Jesus, we not only continue doing his works of power, but we're also called to continue doing his kingdom work, his work of announcing to people the good news and showing them that the kingdom of God has come near to them. Think about this with me, church. When somebody gives you a power of attorney, it's not so that you can do your own thing with it. You know, if you get a power of attorney and you do your own thing, you're going to be in trouble. If somebody gives me a power of attorney, it's so that I can serve that person, so that I can carry out their wishes and their needs, not my own. It is about me being authorized to work for the good of somebody else. And in just that very same way, think about it. Jesus has authorized you and me to use his name to demonstrate the power of the kingdom of God to other people for their good and for his glory. In Luke chapter 4, Luke gives us, uh, Jesus gives us a glimpse of what that kingdom looks like when it touches our world. And these are the things for which God has given you the name of Jesus to use. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of the Lord's favor. That's why Jesus gave you his name to use so that you could do those wonderful kingdom things that he was doing. Praise God. Church, we need to have faith, new faith, more faith, bigger faith, more confident faith in the name of Jesus. We need to understand the purpose of using his name. We need to understand and rely upon the fact that we have been given the high heavenly privilege of using his name in prayer and using his name as a powerful weapon. We need to be convinced again of the incredible authority, the power that God has invested, the power that God has placed, has put within the name of Jesus. Just like Peter and John, we need to learn again that Jesus' name through faith in his name, can heal the sick and do mighty miracles of power. It still is true today as it ever was. God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every other name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So church today, let's have faith 
in Jesus name come on would you stand together with me would you make a shout today and a praise to the name of Jesus come on give glory to the name of Jesus in this house hallelujah oh come on somebody magnify the name of the Lord hallelujah